that, I'm going to call up uh, Jeff as he brings the word tonight. There, let me let me move my stuff first, then you can, and I'll take that too. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. Father, we come before you this evening, Lord, as uh, we want to lift up the word to you. God, uh, we pray that uh, the words that you've uh, spoken to my brother Jeff, Lord, that you would help him to uh, repeat them, Lord, not word for word, because that's not how your word works, but through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would you use his personality, um, would you use his history, and would you use his life in this moment to speak into our lives, Lord. Uh, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in and through Jeff. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> How's everybody tonight? Fantastic. All right. All right, guys. Title of tonight's message is Don't Fail the Test. We're going to be in Jude 12 to 19. Um, but before we get started, let's just go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Gracious Father, Lord, uh, I just come before you now, Father, and I just pray for myself and for these men here, Lord, that we would use this time tonight. We would use it wisely, that we would use it to grow in our faith and our knowledge and our trust in you, Father. I pray that you would just pour into everyone here tonight and strengthen them in their walk, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so again, we're going to be in the book of Jude tonight. Um, and before I start out in the verses that are from our study, I kind of want to quickly go into, again, just why Jude wrote this epistle. Um, he's incredibly concerned about the threat of heretical teachers uh, and he condemns the practice of the ungodly and counsels us to contend for the faith. So with the exception of the first two and the last two verses of this letter, uh, the entire epistle revolves around the problem of false teachers. I have a quick outline here of the, uh, the book of Jude. Uh, purpose of Jude is in verses 1 to 4, description of false teachers 5 to 16, the defense against false teachers, 17 to 23, and then doxology, doxology 24 to 25. So, right, we're, we're kind of in between two and three there tonight. Um, and this outline could be broken down a lot more, but it's pretty basic. Just a little bit of help us with, uh, with our study. But let's go ahead and get started. I want to read verse three. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So Jude is concerned because the faith, the Christian message of the gospel is under attack from false teachers who are spreading dangerous heresies. So Jude urges his readers to contend for the faith against those who seek to undermine and erode it. All right, the Greek word for Jude, he chooses here, is translated to contend earnestly. Usually describes an athlete striving with extreme intensity to win the victory of a physical competition. The Amplified uh, Bible translated as uh, to fight strenuously for the defense of the faith. So this is what Jude is after. He aims at enlivening the church to an immediate and intense struggle, a very real fight requiring all of our energy. And uh, in verse 4, it says here, For certain people have crept in unnoticed. How long ago, or who long ago, were designated for this condemnation? Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So he starts out by saying, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. You can hear the contempt for them in his words. The, the certain people here in verse 4, 
later become these people in 8 and 10, and simply just these in 12, 16, and 19. So Jews called to contend for the faith stems from his assessment of these people, about whom he abs has absolutely nothing good to say about. So we look at these descriptive phases, right, which he describes in verse 4. Designated for this condemnation, ungodly people, they pervert the grace of God into sensuality. Right, so we are contending for the faith. We are contending against the apostates, the false teachers, the ungodly. The false teachers in their sanctioning of immoral behavior, they pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality. And their rejection in the, of the deity of Christ, the, they deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. So now that we're reminded of the why of Jude, right? Contend for the faith. Let's look at the who. Who are these people? And the verses tonight, Jude is very poetic, right? He paints vivid pictures of the people he's describing. I'll go ahead and read these verses, uh, all of them, and then we'll go back and start at verse 12. All right, Jude, verse 12. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts. As they feast with you, without fear shepherds feeding themselves waterless clouds swept along by the winds fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead uprooted wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever verse 14 it was also about these that enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires they are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. In verse 17, But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. All right, so in verse 12 and 13, Jude is, is describing the very nature of these people, right? Look how he puts it. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, right? Just the imagery from hidden reefs. It's easy to just paint a picture in your mind of just some ship sailing across the ocean, right? The precious cargo that is your faith is aboard. It's dark, you can't see anything. And then you just hear this ripping and crashing, right? As wood's just being ripped apart, right? It's undone by these hidden reefs. And the expression love feast, which actually only occurs one time uh, in this verse here, verse 12, the love feast was likely held to create fellowship among the diverse members of the church by encouraging them to share with and care for one another, especially in terms of wealthy Christian charity towards others, like the poor, the widows, the needy, and the hungry. Right? It was a clear expression of a church's concern for the physical needs of the poor. So he goes on to say, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves. They have no fear of being caught, of being found out. Right? They look just like you and me, they look the part of a Christian. They sound like a Christian. Right? They sit in church every Sunday, uh, all the while denying our Lord Jesus Christ. They, they're eager to fill their bellies from the church pantries, uh, but they're unwilling to fulfill their obligations to the people of the church. They care nothing about others, only themselves. Jude says they are shepherds feeding themselves. 
This description is very similar to Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 to 10. Let's go there. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Even to the shepherds, thus say the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, and the strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought, with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you, sure, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. So in these verses, God is condemning the shepherds of Israel, the leaders of Israel, um, from exploiting the people, using them for their own gain and their own pleasure instead of caring for them as they should have. They were feeding themselves and serving their own interests rather than looking out for the people. These selfish shepherds had not met the needs of the people, leaving them weak, diseased, broken, scattered, and lost. And perhaps even worse, rather than helping the people, these shepherds dominated them. Instead of being cared for, the people were scattered and became food for the beasts of the field. That is, they fell prey to their enemies. They wandered about with no one caring for them because those who were responsible for their care were focused only on themselves. And these false, self-interested, spiritual shepherds existed in ancient Israel and equally troublesome shepherds are active in the church today. Like the leaders of Israel in Ezekiel, these people, these apostates, they have no concern for you or the church. They corrupt everything they can corrupt, and they only care for themselves, shepherding nobody but themselves, making sure they get what they want with no concern for anybody else, living and desiring only to gratify their own sensual lusts. Jesus also spoke about these false prophets in John 10, 12, and 13, where he says, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Verse 13, he flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And also in verse 12, Jude goes on to describe them as waterless clouds. Empty clouds without water, they are empty of holiness. They are empty of godliness. Now, when I first started studying these, these verses here, I thought about my life and I tried to think of, well, when does this ever happen in my life? And the only thing that ever really came up, or at least the first thing that came up, was from when I was like six years old. I was in T-ball. I played for a team called the Baltimore Orioles, or at least the Orioles. I don't even remember. But I had a pennant for the Orioles on my wall and some neighbor's older brother, stepbrother that didn't really live there decided he liked it and wanted to trade for it. So I said, well, yeah, I'll trade for it. And I wanted some outrageous stuff like a full uniform, a hat, balls, everything. And he said, yeah, I'll give that to you. Absolutely. So he takes a pennant and I got nothing, right? And he promised me all these things that I wanted and I got nothing, right? That's these waterless clouds. They promise things and they, they give you nothing. Right? These false teachers, they're like these waterless clouds. 
They talk a good talk, but there's nothing to show for it. They promise spiritual refreshment, but none ever comes. They make a show of their knowledge and their gifts, but no one benefits. When people set their expectation on waterless clouds, they will continue in their dry and parched condition. Right? When they drink the water offered by the false teachers, they will be thirsty again. That's John 4.13. And only Jesus can provide the thirst-quenching, soul-satisfying water unto eternal life. John 4.14. Only he provides the showers of blessings we need. Um, and the ancient word of the wise applies to them. Proverbs 25, 14 says, Like clouds and wind without rain is one who boasts of gifts never given. And his next description uh, is my favorite. It's fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, or you can't get any more fruitless than that. You can't get any more dead than that. So how do we spot these false teachers? We look at the fruit they produce or fail to produce. We look at the clouds and the rain they promise to bring or fail to bring. It tells us everything we need to know about them. Jude describes here something that should produce for the benefit of others. The trees should be bearing fruit, but they're fruitless. They're dead. They're double dead. Right? They're uprooted. Because they're not connected to the ground, there's no life coming into them. And because there's no life coming into them, there's no life coming out of them. Right? There is no fruit because they are uprooted. Um, and when I read this one, it also reminded me of uh, some scripture here. Uh, Psalm 1 the first four verses were just the exact opposite of what's being described here where it says blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners nor sits in the seat of scoffers but his delight is in the law of the lord and on his law he meditates day and night he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Right, so the image of a flourishing tree is a rich image to describe a believer's life. The wicked are not so. So those are just the descriptions of verse 12. And I don't really have time to do verse 13, so we're going to move on to 14 and 15. Right, so in verse 14, it says, It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So these verses here are a quote from the book of Enoch. Um, and a lot of people have a problem with the fact that Jude is quoting from a book that's not the Bible, not the Old Testament. Um, so I want to say a little something about that real quick. It'll just take a minute. So we don't really know a whole lot about Enoch because there's not a lot about Enoch in the Bible. Most of what we get is from Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, where it says, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So while very little is written about him, what is is pretty spectacular. We know that he walked with God, right? So Jude was quoting from a prophecy in the book of Enoch, specifically 1 Enoch 1.9. Now the fact that Jude quoted from Enoch does not imply that Enoch's teachings are inspired and should have been in the Bible or in Scripture. Lots of people seem to have a problem with this, like I said, but other authors of the Bible, they did the same thing. For example, Paul quoted some non, and I'm going to get this word wrong, uh, non-canonical statements that he considered to be true. 
There you go. In Acts 17, 28, uh, he quoted Eretus and Clintus. And in 1 Corinthians, he quoted uh, Menander. Also in Titus, Paul quoted from a Cretan poet and philosopher where he says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Right, so it's not outside of the realm that other people have quoted. I mean, pastors quote from other books that aren't in the Bible on a regular basis. And it's done to prove a point. It's done to, to show the truth that is in the Bible. So Jude believed these quotations to be true, but not the entire book. And he used it to show the certainty of the false teacher's doom. Uh, but let's get back to verses 14 and 15. All right, so the ungodly, they're convicted. And they're convicted of two things. First, they are convicted of their deeds of ungodliness. Jude further describes these deeds as being committed in such an ungodly way, their works are completely saturated in ungodliness, from their origin through their execution to their outcome. Second, they are convicted of all the harsh things the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Special focus is now given to the words of the ungodly, which they use to blaspheme God and his ways. This last expression is especially relevant for these false teachers. Jude was confronting who blaspheme all they do not understand. Now, as if all of this that I've said before isn't enough, all the things Jude has listed here, he continues in verse 16. He says, these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage, right? Grumblers and malcontents, right? Just following their own sinful desires. I want to stop and ask a question. Like, you've heard all of these things. How do we know if somebody is an apostate, right? They're not wearing signs admitting it. They don't wear shirts that say apostate, right? <laughs> but uh, how do we know? I mean, just in this, in this letter alone, right, Jude describes apostates as ungodly and as of those who use God's grace as a license to commit unrighteous acts. Right, beginning with ungodly, Jude lists 18 things that are unsavory traits about these, unflattering traits about these apostates. Right, in verse 4 there, number 1, he says they're ungodly. They're morally perverted. They deny Christ defile the flesh, they're rebellious, they revile angels, ignorant about God, they have false visions, they're self-destructive, grumblers, malcontents, self-satisfying, they use arrogant words and false flattery, they are mockers of God, they cause division, they are worldly-minded, devoid of spirit, unsaved. So I look at this list, man. This is a huge list. It should be easy to tell an apostate. Like, they should be walking around like their neon signs just flashing, right? Ungodly. Look at me. I'm ungodly, right? But it's not easy, right? They creep in unnoticed. They look like Christians. They talk like Christians. So what do we do with this information, right? How do we take this knowledge with these characteristics of these people, how do we spot them, right? How do we recognize these hidden reefs who are cre creeping in, hoping to shipwreck our faith? Well, I want to leave you with two applications on, on how we can do that. You want to test them, and you want to test yourself, right? And what do I mean when I say test them? And I'm talking about leaders and teachers, right? You can't just trust somebody because they're standing behind a pulpit, right? You can't trust somebody just because they have one million followers on social media. You can't trust somebody because they lead a church that's got 10,000 people that attend, right? Paul the Apostle, he congratulated the Bereans because they received what he said with readiness of mind, but they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. You've got to test them. Right? We need, and how do we test them? Well, there's a couple ways that I'll mention tonight, but there's more. 
but we look at their character, right? We know their characteristics, but we have to look at their character. Do they have the fruit of the Spirit? Can you look at their lives and see love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, right? How else can we spot them? Well, we can listen to them. What are they saying? What are they teaching? What are they preaching? Right? Do they teach about the core biblical doctrines of faith? Right? Do they teach about holiness? Do they teach about the narrow road? Or are their messages just more like pep rallies? Are they more interested in tickling your ears than in telling you the truth? You've got to test them. We have got to stay in the word, right? We can't be fooled by sheep costumes, man. We need to test them. We need to test what they say. We need to test what they do. And we need to find out if it lines up with the word of God, right? And we need to test ourselves, right? Are you saved? Am I saved? Right? This is a question we should be asking ourselves. It is the most important issue in all of life. Nothing else in our lives matters more than that. Whether or not you have a nice house, a nice car, a good job, money in the bank, they matter nothing in comparison. When you're dead, the only thing that matters is are you spending eternity with God or without him? So we need to test ourselves. And I'm not saying question your faith, but ask yourself, is your love towards Jesus genuine? When you look up at this list here, right, does your life, life reflect this or does it reflect the fruit of the Spirit? Right, verse 18 says, In the last time there will be scoffers following their ungodly passions. What we want isn't always good. What we want isn't always godly. What we want to do isn't always what God wants us to do. Right, we need to test ourselves. Right? Takeaway tonight, apostates, false teachers, they claim to know God, but they live as though God doesn't even exist. This is how they blaspheme God. Make sure this isn't you. Test yourself. I'm going to finish tonight with the verse, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, God, we, uh, I just thank you again for this time tonight to just dig into your word, Lord, and I pray that uh, you would open our hearts to hear from you as we break up into groups, Lord. Help the men to just speak boldly and courageously about you. In Jesus' name, amen.